God, you are love and hold us in love. We gather to worship you this morning. In a year of uncertainty filled with iniquities and affliction, your love, O oh God, has steadfastly endured. Breathe your loving spirit into our distressed, troubled, and weary hearts. May we find rest and renewal in Christ, who is pure compassion and unbounded love. Let us continue in worship and get lost together in wonder, love, and praise. and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm so glad that you're joining us in worship today. And if you're a guest with us, I'm especially glad that you're joining us. If you are a guest, be sure and fill out our virtual guest card or email us at pastor at wilshirebc.org. That way, someone from our staff can reach out to you um, and can get to know you a little bit better as you get to know us a little bit better. Um, but we're so glad that you're joining us in worship this morning. There's a lot happening in the life of our church right now. Uh, and this Wednesday evening, um, the, the resident-led Wednesday evening series, Living Lent, is continuing. We've been doing this study uh, to share different spiritual practices you can engage in during this Lenten season. And so this Wednesday at 6 p.m., you can join Jenna Sullivan on Facebook Live uh, as she leads us in the spiritual practice of yoga. I also want to be sure to remind you to sign up for our Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday morning worship services. Now, those services are going to be in the parking lot, but it's going to be different than church in the lot. This is not church in the lot, but this is Sunday morning worship. So we're going to have services on Palm Sunday at 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. That way you have time to get home for Sunday school or you have time after Sunday school to get here for the 11 o'clock service. And on Easter Sunday, we're going to have services at 8 a.m., 9.30 a.m., and 11 a.m. 
You will have seen in the tapestry this week the, the link to sign up for those services. So go ahead, sign up for those services. All you have to do is sign up and bring yourself. We will provide the chairs for you. Friends, I probably don't have to tell you that this past week has been the one year anniversary of our lives all drastically changing due to COVID-19. And if you're like me, you've probably really felt the weight, the pain, and the grief of that this week. It's been a year since I've stood in this pulpit and looked out at the sanctuary and seen your faces. And it's hard. Each week, whether it's a greeting or scripture reading, a prayer, celebrating communion, or preaching a sermon, it gets harder and harder to do this to an empty sanctuary. And I think my colleagues would agree with me on that. And I know it gets harder and harder each week to sit and watch the service at home. But the end is in sight. If you read the report from our COVID task force this week, then you know that we just have to hold on just a little bit longer. So today, know that you are really, really, really loved. We love each and every one of you dearly. We miss each and every one of you so much. And we're here for you if you need us especially as we're all sitting in that weight of it being a full year. Don't hesitate to reach out to someone on church staff if you need to. And so this morning, as we worship together, know how much you are loved and how much you are missed by us. I'm so glad that you're joining us in worship this morning. Let us continue in worship together. A reading from Psalms. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he's good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities, endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their troubles, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out the word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. And let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs and of joy. About a millennia ago, Maimonides wrote that whenever anything in the universe strikes us as stupid or ugly or absurd, then it's because our breadth of knowledge is too narrow and our depth of understanding too shallow for us to perceive God's intent. Lord knows, I hope He is right. Because His adjectives, stupid, ugly, and absurd, are excellent descriptions of the year I've had. There is so much that died inside of me this year. Some things that needed to die. Egotism and selfishness. Others that I grieve deeply. Optimism. Pride. But we are a people created in the image of a God who in the beginning creates order out of chaos. We too in chaos create order. In noise we arrange music. 
In Babylon, we plant gardens. Kierkegaard says that life can only be understood at backward, but lived forward. That we are still alive today. To search for beauty and meaning is magnificent. For it seems that God paints with long brush strokes. I think about the past year and what has been lost. I think about milestones that passed quietly and memories that weren't made, fellowship with friends and church family that I've missed, and the loss of what felt normal. This time last year, we were reading Barbara Brown Taylor's An Altar in the World, and the book became a bit of a guide for me. I already wanted so much to be on the other side of whatever this was going to be, but she reminded me that the journey is the point and my way through was going to be in being fully present. I do grieve for things lost these past 12 months, but I'm also grateful for the space that I have found in them. I'm continuing to learn to let go of expectations that I place on myself and have found space to better honor my body and to listen to what she's telling me space to better love my neighbors and hear what they're telling me, space to just be present. Barbara Brown Taylor says, I give thanks for even the semi-terrible things that have happened to me since they have shown me what is really real. I pray that as some of our normal returns, that I don't lose sight of what is really real and that I don't pick back up the lost things that were maybe normal, but definitely not best. About 18 months ago, my wife Allison and I and our two kids, Nathaniel and Caroline, joined Wilshire. We were very happy to be a part of the Wilshire community. Part of us coming to Dallas, though, was my wife and I both taking on new roles. We've both been in the gig economy in these, these 18 months. And as you can imagine, for the past year, that's created some challenges for us. Thankfully, I can say, really without much hesitation at all, that God has been faithful in the midst of these circumstances. But what has had to, to die in me over these past few months is um, my desire for control, to have everything worked out in advance, to know what's going to happen in advance. I think we probably all feel that way a little bit. Instead, what I've had to do is to walk by faith, um, to trust that even in the midst of difficult circumstances, you know, kind of literally in the valley of the shadow of death, that God was going to be with us. And that's been good. Um, not easy, but good. Um, but then again, I, I suppose it's not supposed to be easy when we're talking about death.
As we pray together this morning, there will be a moment of silence in prayers of the people where I will invite you to speak aloud right where you are the name of a family member or, or a friend who has suffered or perhaps even died from COVID-19. Lord of this glorious universe, we give you thanks for the gift of this day, this Lord's Day, this day of worship, this day of remembering we have been worshiping separately now for an entire year. Lord, we are tired, we are worn, we are ready for this to be over. We long for the sound of singing in church, and we long for the company of our sisters and brothers in Christ. Give us patience and perseverance. God, we pray for our family and friends and members near and far who have suffered and died from COVID-19. In this moment of silence, we remember and we whisper their names aloud to you. Lord of all hopefulness, now we give you thanks for the researchers and the scientists who have discovered new vaccines, and we thank you for the hope that is growing in us because of their good work. We give thanks for all medical personnel everywhere who fought to save lives at risk to their own. Even this day, will you grant every nurse and doctor and physical therapist and aid strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. And we pray for our neighbors, especially in South and West Dallas, who have suffered much more than we have. Lord, forgive us when we have ignored their suffering. Let us be instruments of your peace. Where there is despair, let us sow hope. And now, Lord, we pray for those in our community of faith who suffer personal pain and grief and loss. We, we pray especially for Michael, Avon, Perry, and David. Give them renewed strength as they continue in rehab. And we pray for Bob continues to be in hospice care. Lord, it is still dark and the road is long. Bring us to your light. Bring us back to worship together. Bring us home at last. In the meantime, give us patience and peace. In the name of Christ, Amen. A Gospel reading from John. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everybody who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe in him, in him are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. 
This is the word of the Lord. His real name is Roland Stewart, but you may know him by Rockin' Roland or the Rainbow Man. Uh, See, he was the white guy during the 1970s and 80s whom you saw at, it seemed like, every major sporting event in America wearing a rainbow Afro wig. Oh, and he was holding up a sign in just the right or wrong position in the crowd, always positioned to photobomb the picture or the video with this sign that read simply, John 3.16. Roland was a deeply troubled man who lived off of an inheritance until it was gone, and then uh, some rich evangelical Christians began to support him. At first, he lived out of his car, smoking weed and trying to get attention as an actor and dancer. But one night, he was watching a Bible prophecy TV program, and he decided that God called him to communicate the gospel message of that verse from the Bible to as many people as he could. Roland made his life work to make himself a spectacle to save souls. Now, it's hard to know which was more important to him, the spectacle of self or the saving of souls. Whatever rock and roll in success in getting people to read John 3.16, we know it didn't really help his own mental health over time as he became more and more paranoid And after a standoff with police in a Los Los Angeles hotel room, he ended up in prison for multiple counts of kidnapping. He remains incarcerated today, serving three consecutive life sentences. And this certainly is not what the shall not perish but have eternal life part of John 3.16 means. John 3.16 is probably the Bible's most recognizable verse. You may remember it from childhood in the King James Version. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The unfortunate case of Roland Stewart and others like him who used that verse, John 3.16, in such a way as to turn off many people to Jesus, maybe as many as they turned on to him, shouldn't affect our devotion to this verse. It's a powerful verse. Martin Luther called it the gospel in miniature. And it's packed with good news. Just look. God loves the world. Now, against ancient views of the gods who toyed with the world for their own pleasure and kept people in fear of their capricious anger, which might undo humans at any moment, John 3.16 unambiguously says that God's disposition toward the world is always and only love. We can depend upon the character of God, in other words. God's love is constant. It does not change because of circumstance. What's more, the world itself is not the cause of God's love. The world, in John's gospel, is under the spell of sin, And it doesn't compel God's love by its innate truth, goodness, or beauty. God loves the world and all of us in it despite its sin. God's love is self-directed. It is God's nature to love, period. Then this, the world doesn't know God or recognize that it is perishing. And so God sends God's only son, 
the beloved one through whom the world was made, the light that lives inside of each of us and all of us that the darkness has never overcome. God gives the Son to live among us as one of us, God with us. By putting our faith in him, the sin sickness that leads to death is replaced with eternal life through him. All that is good news. The kind of news that has led people to put their faith and trust in Jesus and it has given them a new sense of life and has deeded peace to people the world over. This verse is a declaration of who God is, of why Christ came, and of what we might do in response in order that we might know the blessing of it. Every text has a context, though. John 3.16 doesn't just float in the air all on its own. To understand it fully, we need to look at what comes before it and after it. That involves the context of the verses just before it and the verses just after it, as well as the wider context of what was going on in John's time and what's been going on since, after this verse. First, consider the verses immediately before verse 16. We often use the word so to mean so much, right? As if John 3.16 starts out, for God loved the world so much that God gave God's son. Now the Greek word here should probably be better understood though as translated just so. That is, for God loved the world in this very way. And what way is that? Well, it's a way that we see in verses 14 and 15, which recounts a strange and wondrous story from Israel's history. The people of God were complaining about the bitterness of their journey in the wilderness. And God had provided quail, uh, manna and quail to eat, along with water from a rock to drink. Yet the people were consumed with self-pity and turned their back on God's mercy. So God sent fiery serpents to nip at the feet and legs of people, and many were perishing in their pain. But God willed, we are told, that none should perish, but all be saved. And so God told Moses to fashion a bronze serpent and fix it on a pole so that any and all who would lift their heads and gaze upon the image of what was killing them would instead be saved by it. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent on a pole in the wilderness so that all might be saved, so the Son of Man must be lifted up on the cross so that all may be saved. That's the background. And there's a deep mystery about the nature of salvation here. We have to face the thing that looks like death to us in order for it to become life to us. Any therapist will tell you that ignoring or denying what has caused you pain will only cause you to perish. Looking at it with courage, though, takes the poison out of it and puts the cure into it. In this same way, the cross that was an instrument of torture and death became by the power of God the source of eternal life for all who would look upon it in faith. What looks like perishing is actually the font of life. The verses after the verse continue this theme. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
the force of God's actions in the wilderness and on the cross is the same. Not that only a remnant would be saved, but that all might be saved. Whatever condemnation we experience then is due to our self-imposed condemnation. Since God did not hold our sin against us, but set the sun to lift it from us, we condemn ourselves. God saves us from our self-condemnation. All right, there's another before and after, though, to this verse. This before is captured earlier in the chapter in the story of Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus, who comes to Jesus at night and cannot bring himself to accept the light he sees in Jesus. In John's gospel, this story reflects the painful reality of the expulsion of Jews who believe in Jesus from synagogue worship among those Jews who did not believe in Jesus. John is assuring those who believe in Jesus and any who would put their faith in him that though they no longer have the support of the community of Israel, they have the support of the God of Israel. The sharp contrast John draws is rooted in the rejection of those who believe in Jesus by those who don't. It doesn't begin with Jesus and his followers. John is constantly trying to show us the cosmic nature of the Christ through whom the worlds were made and how he is at work drawing all people to God. Christ is lifted up so that all may be saved, not so that some may be damned. John would not mean, verse 316, to say the opposite, or he would then be guilty of the same spirit that caused the rift between God's people. The rejected would then become the rejectors, and that's not the gospel, which leads to the other after context of this verse today. This grand statement of God's universal love for all has become in the hands of some Christians a way of dividing people against one another instead of uniting people to one another. A Texas state representative just this week tweeted, the true gospel of Jesus is radically exclusive. Hashtag TexLedge. Now, aside from the question of why a politician who is supposed to represent all his constituents regardless of their faith feels the need to become a Twitter theologian, you have to wonder what his motivation is. It seems to be the spirit of Christian nationalism that sees only those who embrace John 3.16 the way he does as truly American. Or Texan, don't you know? Contrast that with the conversation in my house this week. Four of our grandchildren are visiting from San Antonio. It's spring break, and so the three girls were getting ready to go see their nana for dinner, as Sharon Vickery lives in Dallas too, and so we share. Some of you understand things like that. Well, the three-year-old, River Shannon, said he wanted to go too. And one of the girls explained to him that he couldn't, that nana was their nana, not his nana, and so he had to stay behind. And River protested, she is my Nana, too. To which 10-year-old Finley replied in wonder, River, you're so inclusive. Didn't even know she knew that word. Now, when you read John 3.16 today, 
I would urge you to do so in a way that you turn to Jesus as the one who saves you from perishing. But I would also urge you to consider all those in the world, faithful Jews and Muslims, Hindus and Buddhists and Sikhs, and all others who you see seeking to live in the light and not the darkness. All those who would say, your God is my God too. And think about this God of John 3.16 who so loves the world that none should perish. And then ask yourself this, is the heart of the God of John 3.16 more exclusive or inclusive? Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you. We have the wonderful privilege of adapting our baby dedication ceremony today and we're here in the prayer garden at Wilshire right in front of the beautiful statue that's called the Children of Peace and we're here today with the Underwoods this is Lindsay mom and dad Travis and baby Lucy who will be one year old next week right, that's right. terrific and the Underwood uh, family over here and the Van Arsdales here and some of our pastoral residents and Joan and Kim. We're so glad that Wilshire gets to be represented even if it's just a few of us. But this is a way that even during COVID we can celebrate the dedication of this child to the Lord and here in what we like to call the precincts of the temple. That is, it may not be inside, but it is inside our hearts and in uh, the, the grounds of our church. And so we're delighted that we get to celebrate this time. Lucy, will you come to me? Hi, Lucy. Hi, I want you to, I want you to meet your church. Lucy, this is Wilshire, and you're gonna get to be inside that building in just a few, few months. And there's a, there's a preschool room for you, and there are people who will hold you and love you and teach you about Jesus and how much God loves you and how glad we are you're here in this world. And I'm going to kind of just walk you around and introduce you. So we're here in the prayer garden and this beautiful place, even during wintertime, reminds us that at the very heart of our faith in this season of Lent is the cross which is inlaid here in the prayer garden, and that though death is at the center of the cross, in just a few weeks, the water is going to be coming up at Easter time and reminding us that life comes out of death. And so you're going to learn that the very basis of our faith is dying to live. And as you grow up among us, 
you'll come to understand more and more of what that means as we cherish you and love you and remind you that you are a gift from God. And so we're glad you're in this world. And I want to ask your parents, do you, do you as parents, do you promise to keep your little girl within the fellowship of the church, within the precincts of the temple, so that she may grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and may come to understand who God is and how God loves her unconditionally and calls her to a future that is uniquely hers. We do. And Wilshire, I know that if you were here, I would be asking you, do you promise to love her and welcome her into your life and teach her about Jesus and what it means to walk spiritually after Jesus? I know you would say, we do. So let us pray. Our good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this beautiful gift of life, for this growing family now, and this, this extended family that has welcomed Lucy into the world. We ask you to bless her. We ask you to give her a good life, not an easy life, a life that is meaningful to her, a life that is in service to you and the world. Grant her your peace and give her parents all that they need to raise her to know you and to develop a solid soul that will be filled with bravery and courage, that will be full of love and blessing. So bless them now as a family, and we give ourselves to you and Lucy too. In Jesus' name, amen. Here we had in worship today another example of our theme during the season of Lent, dying to live. How we need to let go and to face up to the things that are causing us to die in order to see the way of Christ that alone leads us to life. And so I hope that you have sensed that in the spirit of this service and in the text and the sermon, and that maybe some of you have come to a place in your life where you're ready to give your own life to Christ. If you would like to profess your faith in Jesus Christ and would like to talk to a minister, perhaps you'd like to join our church, become part of this community of faith, even during this time of COVID lockdown, uh, we're moving toward a time when we're going to regather, uh, God willing and COVID don't rise, uh, you know how that works. Uh, well, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to talk with you and uh, talk about your faith journey and your relationship to the church. You can email us at pastor at wilshirebc.org and we'd be delighted to do that. Some of you are already Christians. You're already professing uh, Christians and would like to talk about a relationship with our church further. Please let us know about that uh, by using that same email address and we'll be in touch with you soon. Uh, thank you for worshiping with us during this Lenten season. Uh, it's, uh, it's a time of journeying with Jesus to the cross until that time of great Easter resurrection. So now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with and upon you all, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>